So yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here. So today I want to talk specifically about a computational method that we developed, it's called STREAM. And you know, this method was initially developed for transcriptomic data, but we recently adapted to other data type. And I just want to say, you know, one slide, you know, my lab is really uh, interested in new technologies because, you know, they can empower us to understand gene regulation. And we are really active in the community, collaborating with people that develop new technologies to develop these tools. And we believe, you know, that these tools are important for the community. So we really embrace what, you know, Nikolai was saying about, you know, sharing data and, you know, on our side, sharing tools and every, everything open source and freely available. So today, you know, I will start, you know, this is the outline. I will first start to introduce some basic concepts. You know, I will try to define what is trajectory inference and pseudo time because, you know, maybe not all the people in the, in, in the audience are familiar with this concept. So to appreciate, you know, the, the method, you, we need to introduce this concept. And then I will present what our work with stream, introducing some of the main features. And then, you know, at the end, I will show you like, how we are thinking about adapting stream uh, on single cell proteomics data. So let's start with the definition of trajectory. There are like several definitions. I like this one. A trajectory is just a model. And you know, it's a model that you can use to describe a potential path of transitions that a cell can undergo during development or in response to a stimulation. And there are like different metaphors that people have used. You know, the most used and abused is the Wandington's landscape, you know, where you have like a cell rolling down, you know, this uh, surface. But, you know, in the original uh, study, actually, there was this other metaphor where you have like train tracks, where, you know, things are, you know, as soon as you commit to a track, you know, going to jump to another track. So the model that I'm describing is more, you know, similar to this, where we are trying to have, you know, some kind of average uh, curves, they will describe, you know, these uh, trajectories. So why do we need single cell resolution to describe, you know, trajectories? Because, you know, if we want to model this transition between single cell states, you know, it would be impossible to do this in bulk. So we really need to measure, you know, for each single cell, what is the state. And with this in mind, let's introduce these two concepts. Like, you know, first the pseudo time, and, you know, the, the concept of pseudo time is really generic, just a numerical value in, you know, whatever unit, you know, the method is proposing, but essentially it's telling you how far you are along a developmental process. So what you see in this picture, often, you know, you may measure, you know, the cells maybe at the single time point. For example, these are, you know, blood cells, but you can still, you know, unroll, you know, an axis that represent a developmental trajectory. And that's essentially the, the concept of the pseudo time. So you take your snapshot data and, you know, based on some methodology, you can discover what may be a, a, a progression. So the trajectory based on this pseudo time can be redefined as the ordering of the cell along, you know, a path that is um, essentially induced by the pseudo time. And, you know, as you can see here, you know, like this is uh, a graph and then, you know, this is the beginning of the pseudo time. So if you follow this graph, you, know, you will see like, you know, the, you know, differentiation process. And this concept was introduced by Cole Trapnell, where, you know, he, he published the monocle one paper. So, you know, all these trajectory inference are based on, you know, this kind of measurement. So usually we have, you know, matrix where you have genes or proteins or other features and the columns here are the cells. So the problem now, you know, with this concept in mind can be formalized as the following. Given that, you know, you, you have this matrix from your experiments and, you know, you can have like transcriptomic data, chromatin accessibility, proteomic data, methylation. Can we learn, you know, what, what are the different lineages and the, the progression, the continuous progression? So there are like a lot of ways that you can do this and the community has been extremely active in developing methods. But if you review like many of the methods, you can actually find, you know, many of the steps that are recurring. So I would just show you like the key ideas and then I will show you like the way we, you know, approach this. So you start from, you know, your matrix of, of uh, measurement and then often you do a feature selection 
some dimensionality reduction, some clustering, and then you try to learn, you know, this structure, you know, we got structure fitting, and then you try to uncover this pseudo time based on the structure that you learn. And also visualization, you know, is really important as, as I will show you. And, you know, like, I, I like this picture from, from this, uh, this paper from 2016 that show like, back then, you know, some of the most popular methods. And, you know, you can see that, you know, many of these, you know, building blocks are, you know, classic, you know, building blocks in machine learning or, you know, data processing. So you can essentially create a new method just combining these blocks. And, you know, this is a, has been like super active. So in 2019, you know, there were like more than 50 methods and, you know, this nice publication, they review like all these methods and then try to explain some of the, the procedures and, you know, which procedure seems to work, you know, better. So when, you know, like we enter in this field, you know, we started probably in 2016. So we were, you know, and we published in 2019. So we were not included in this, in this uh, unfortunately, in this study. But, you know, the, the problem that we try to solve, you know, with our trajectory method compared to other methods is that many of the methods cannot recover complex trajectories. So if you have a simple linear trajectory, all the methods are doing a reasonable job. Where you have like complex trajectories, you may find, you know, maybe too many branches or, you know, artifacts. And also we spend a lot of time in visualization. And also we introduce, you know, this concept of mapping procedure that's really popular in multi-omics where people try to map different data sets. In this particular context, it's uh, slightly different. So what we are trying to do here is like given a reference trajectory that you learn from a sample, you can project new data from the same data type in the trajectory that you learn. And as I will show you, like, this is really helpful if you, for example, want to study perturbations of, you know, key genes or proteins. Another innovation was like to use, you know, to extend this, um, this trajectory inference to other data type. So we were one of the first methods to uh, adopt this procedure for chromatin accessibility, specifically single cell attack seek. And then, you know, of course we got super excited about proteomic data and I will show you later our work. This is not in the original publication, it's still in a work in progress. And, and finally, like we spend a lot of time to create, you know, to so everyone, you know, can explore, you know, the inferred trajectories in an interactive way. So, so all, you know, these innovations were published last year in a, in a paper in National Communication and Idong Chen is the main postdoc that, you know, is behind this work. And, and Jonathan is a PhD student that helped to develop the interactive visualizations. So, so this is the, in our vision for stream. So we started from single cell RNA-seq and the toxic data. And, you know, based on, on different data type, we have some procedures that are, uh, can interact with other tools. And we can create, you know, a specific analysis for each data type. And in our vision, we have this tool already, we want to extend to proteomic state and DNA methylation. So to show you the features of stream, I will first, you know, briefly explain, you know, some of the plot that we can create or the functionality on uh, single cell rna seq data. So this is the overview of, uh, of the procedure. So there are like different steps. I will just briefly explain, uh, but, you know, feel free to reach me out later or, you know, read the paper. So the, the steps are, you know, first feature selection, you're going to use all the genes as they are. Then we do some dimensionality reduction, and then we learn, you know, a structure, the most parsimonious structure to describe the data based on our optimization function and our data structure called LP graph. And then we have a finalized structure that we can explore and extract, you know, insights from. So feature selection, dimensionality reduction are key important points of all these trajectory inference methods. And the problem is that you cannot use all the genes uh, or all the proteins or, I mean, all the proteins we will see actually is not too bad, but in general, you know, you want to reduce the space because you have this problem of the course of dimensionality. Essentially the distances are not any more reliable if you use the full space. So it's, it's good to, you know, go in a subspace and you can do this by feature selection or by classic dimensionality reduction. For feature selection, there are a lot of ideas 
And you know, you, the idea is like you want to select informative genes for your process. Often you don't know what is the process that you want to model. So people have proposed this idea of variable genes. And there are like several papers explaining this concept in detail. The, the key idea is like, can we select genes that are more variable than the expectation? And this can reflect essentially heterogeneity in your populations. And you can essentially discover, you know, the, the genes that are driving this. For dimensional reduction, there are so many options. For trajectory inference, we actually studied this systematically. And you know, here I just show you like how can you, you know, given let's say this ground through in 3D, like of the different methods are actually seeing this space if you just reduce, you know, in, into D. And you can see there are dramatic differences here for the different methods. The method that you know in our experience works really well is the modified local linear embedding is slow compared to other methods, but it's the most accurate. A good compromise is to use the spectral embedding. And then, you know, if you have huge and massive data sets, you can use PCI. But usually spectral embedding is a good compromise. So MLLE is like a modified local linear embedding. Actually, this paper is really old, but, you know, this method is really elegant. So you start, you know, from your uh, original, uh, original space. And, you know, the key idea here is that you take, you know, the neighbors in the original space and try to predict, you know, the point, each, each point, in this case, each cell. And you learn, you know, some weights uh, to predict this particular point in the original space. And then you just, you know, swap the optimization. So now you fix the weights that you learn in the original space and you try to reconstruct the position of that point. So mathematically, it's really simple to write this and really elegant. And, and works really well. So that, that's, you know, what we use by default in stream. So after, you know, this procedure, you know, you, you know, you did feature selection, dimensionality reduction, you, you get, you know, something that looks like this. In this case, it's three dimensions. And, you know, these different colors are different fact sorted labels for, for blood development. And then finally, we want to learn, you know, these trajectories. So now you need to fit a uh, you know, this model. And for this model, we first do a pre-initialization. So we do something really simple. We first cluster the space to find regions that are stable. And then we do a minimum spanning tree to have, you know, kind of a rough skeleton of what a structure may look like. And then you get, you know, this kind of initialization. And then based on this, we uh, train, um, uh, uh, LP graph model. So we learn essentially a graph that, you know, parsimoniously explain, you know, your cloud of points in whatever space, you know, you embedded them. And, you know, the, 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 the optimization function is really simple. Uh, so we, we optimize three things, mean square error of, you know, each cell to the, to the learned, you know, trajectories. And then there is something proportional to the total length so you, you don't want, you know, have trajectory that, you know, go uh, zigzag like crazy. And then also some kind of a measure of symmetry that, you know, formally is called harmonicity. And this is the work from Andrei Zinovi and Luca Bergantes. So we had a really nice collaboration. They really helped us to adapt this framework to single cell. And, you know, it's really scalable and works really well in our experience. So after this step, from you know the initial matrix, finally we have a space, and we have you know these different trajectories that try to describe you know this manifold. So this is great, you know we have a model, but up to here you know we didn't learn anything. We just created a nice three D plot. So how can we extract the inside? So can we extract you know the key genes that you know are driving these trajectories? So that's you know the second segment, and you know here is really important to think about visualization techniques that you may adopt. So what can we learn, you know, from this? So as an example, you know, I will show you like some of these features, the visualization features in this uh, transcriptomic data set. So this is like uh, um, 1600 cells, around 4,700 informative genes. And you know, if you're not familiar with blood development, on top of the hierarchy of hematopoietic stem cell, they are multipotent, and this is the classic tree. In reality, this has been, you know, like debated a lot, but for simplicity, you know, this is like the model that, you know, we're using, and, you know, they use facts to isolate the different 
to sample from the different uh, parts of the hierarchy. So based on stream, and this is essentially the structure I showed you before. So we have you know, this idea of subway map plot. So even if you have a really complex space, maybe you don't need to look at this, but you can simplify. And the idea is like, you can keep the, the information that you need to understand you know, the, the progression. So it's like when you take the, the T, you know, if you're in Boston, the subway, you don't care about all the details, but you just care how far you know, is the next stop and how many stops do I have to take. So you know, in this um, idea, we preserve the length of the trajectory in the original space. And another thing that we preserve is like, how far was each cell from the line that you inferred? So this is like the confidence that you are. So based on this, you know, we have been in the x-axis the pseudo time, and we have a nice progression, and we see like the different branches that the model, you know, is seeing. And this is much easier than, you know, looking at this 3, 3D plot or, you know, I-dimensional plot, because this can be more than 3D. So this is great, but there is a problem with this. So if I show you this plot and I ask you, how many cells do you have here? Given that the distance is the confidence, you can have a lot of cells here that are on top of each other. So, you know, it's not possible to answer this question. So for this, we have this stream plot. And this stream plot, you know, we essentially try to model the density, keeping the tree structure. But then we can annotate this based on external labels. In this case, these are the fact sorted labels. And, you know, based on this plot, it's really nice to see all the cells starting from Matopedistan cell, you know, transition to MPP, and then they go to the different branches. So together, these two plots are a really powerful way to explore, you know, your trajectories. And again, you know, like our procedure doesn't use this information, of course, to infer this trajectory. So based on this, now you can start to answer question about, you know, what are the key genes that, you know, may mediate, you know, like the commitment to a particular lineage. For example, here, you know, you have the, the first two references that I showed you before, and this is like what, you know, this plot will look like when you, you know, project a gene. For example, here we show GATA1 and, you know, I live red cells are, you know, highly expressing, you know, GATA1. And you can see this in this plot, but as well in the stream plot. So this is a clear, you know, marker for erythroid, then, you know, we, we can recover this strong signal. Of course, you don't want to look gene by gene if you have like thousands of genes. So we have an automatic procedure to find essentially genes that are important for the, for the structure. So the two ideas are diverging genes. So these are genes that are, you know, just at the branch. So you want to know like, if you want to go to one branch or the other one, what are the important genes? And the other, you know, important genes are the, um, the one um, essentially that correlate with the pseudo time. So just to give you an example, for example, you want to know the genes that go to S4 or S5. So our procedure automatically detects genes that will look like this. So in this case, you know, this super strong gear and this gene is super strong gear. And, you know, like we didn't know enough about, you know, blood by but talking with biologists and looking on, you know, previous literature, the genes that we uncover are actually relevant that has been described before. And for transition gene, the, the query is different. So here you care about a single trajectory. So as you progress in this trajectory, you want to know the genes that follow you know, this progression. And again, here we can recover automatically these genes. And you know, these two genes, I didn't know their function, but you know, it was reassuring to see that people before have described these genes. And this is actually a really interesting gene that is expressed everywhere in blood, but except you know, for this branch. And you know, we can recover beautifully this pattern. So we have you know, another, you know, as I mentioned before, we have this mapping feature that we believe is really important now that are in the area of you know, perturbation with CRISPR or other you know, molecules. So usually you build a trajectory of normal development, but let's say you want to understand what happened to your trajectory if you perturb uh, a gene, a protein, and so on. So with, the, with this mapping feature, you can, you can essentially do that. So you first build, you know, your trajectory based let's say, on the normal condition, then you can project new data. And I will show you just a simple vignette. So we we'll analyze this data where they had genetic perturbation. This is again, blood development. And they were focusing on the differentiation between monocyte and granulocytes. 
And you know, in this paper, they uncovered two key transcription factors for these uh, um, for these branches that are GFI1 and the RF8. And you know, in our analysis, we also recovered this. But you know, interesting in the paper, they actually perturbed these genes and they did a single or double knockout. And with stream, you can actually project for each of these uh, categories where the cell will go in the reference trajectory. And you know, we can also validate you know, what they have shown. So for example, if you have the GFI1 um, knockout, you, you will go, instead of going to granulocyte, now you're going to the other branch. You will go to the monocyte, RFA, you know, the opposite. And if you do this double knockout, you know, you're kind of stuck or there is no preference. And this is also described in the, in the paper. So this is a kind of visualization that you know, we envision it can be helpful to study genetic perturbation. So, so we are back at the overview. So I, I hope you, know, you have a sense of the main feature of stream. So I just want to show you another small vignette of how different is to adapt you know, what we have to a new data type. And you know, this was described in the paper. So briefly, I will talk about single cell ataxic, that is a, a way to measure chromatin accessibility. And chromatin accessibility is a proxy to find regulatory regions in the genome. So, so this is a, a, was a really nice collaboration with Jason Berbrostro and Caleb LaRue. And they had you know, this uh, really nice technique to profile single cell chromatin accessibility. And they published you know, this milestone paper with the Greenleaf Lab in Cell. And they profiled the human bone marrow. And you know, based on their analysis here, they just use PCA and they clearly see different uh, populations. So, we team up with them and, and we, we were trying to say, oh, can we recover trajectories you know, from, from this formally? And you know, I just give you the vignette, yes, you can. But the key point I want to highlight here is that you need to totally change you know, the features and the way you think about the problem. Because, you know, the data are dramatically different. You don't have expressed genes, but here you have accessible region. So what we did here was to, instead of using uh, uh, genes, we use uh, short DNA sequences called, you know, K-MERS. And you know, in this case, we use seven MERS. So you have, you know, these short DNA sequences. And then the, the idea is that in each single cell, you can see how accessible on average is each sequence across the entire genome. And then based on this, you have, you know, this nice set of features. We do like, you know, a, a principle of component analysis based on this. And then you run stream as I showed you before, and you get this beautiful trajectory. So you can recover really well the different you know, lineages. But importantly, given that you have short DNA sequences, I'm sure you have in your mind the concept of binding sites, right? So you can actually map these DNA sequences to transcription factor binding sites. And now you can link the regulators to the binding sites. And for example, again, you show that GATA one that I showed you before was at the expression level. It was important for Eritroid. Here, you know, I show you that the uh, binding sites of GATA one are more open in the cells that will go toward the Eritroid differentiation. So quick vignette. And finally, we are in the proteomic uh, segment. And this is the work of Chen Zhang, a bioinformatician, um, in, in my lab. And we just started this actually one month ago. And we are super excited. And, you know, we were looking around for data sets. And then, you know, like, of course, we, you know, look at scope two. And, you know, we realized this. It was an amazing resource because it's so well documented, so clear, you know, all the data are online. And also, Nikolai, you know, was super helpful, you know, in guiding us to move to, to this new field. So thank you, Nikolai. So the, the, the technology, you know, we don't need to explain. So the data set was already explained uh, before. So we are using uh, this uh, monocyte to macrophage differentiation system. So I will show you our preliminary resu results here. So, you know, just before, you know, going there, you know, I just want to show you an analogy for developers like us, you know, computational labs. It's really important to, you know, to have, you know, something that is a good entry point to develop your methods. On top, you see like the common 10x, you know, workflow that, you know, now is 
so used and you know like you know like a, a, a important thing that they did was to create you know some kind of pre-processing package that give you a account matrix if you want and this enables several developers to actually develop tools specifically for for this technology so in the, in, in the case of you know single set proteomics we were really excited to see that you know Nikolai, other people have already, you know, tried to establish, you know, a, a pipeline and a workflow. So in, the, in, in this case, you know, like we, we have already Max Quant and Dart ID, and then we can use, you know, like what is coming from Dart ID as an input to, to stream. And more, you know, in particular, if there are like developers, you know, in the call, you know, I really encourage you to go to the website where everything is really well documented. And you know there is like this nice matrix of peptides by cells, and then you know they clearly explain the the protocol and how do you transform you know this peptide quantification from Dart ID to a protein matrix. And you know here I'm using the same you know process data, so they were imputed to resolve the the missing data, and the protein level actually the median of the peptides, and then they were locked to transform. And then you know they propose you know in the in the paper this way that PCA and you know we we tried this but we also tried without. So this is the matrix that we are you know using for stream and also like in the website they have also this nice annotation that can help us to investigate potential batch effect and also the cell type annotation so we can visualize how well we are doing with our trajectories. So with this in mind, let me show you some preliminary results. So this is the common workflow of stream that I showed you before. So we load the data, pre-process, and visual selection. This was already done to, by Nikolai. Dimensionality reduction, right now what we are doing, we are exploring different techniques. And these three panels show you like if you use all the proteins, so we don't do any visual selection here, and you use the PCA, actually you get a plot that is not so different from what you know they show in the paper, so you clearly see the first dimension separating monocyte and macrophages. And these are our you know, techniques, the spectral embedding and modified local linear embedding. And you can see that you know, this may, may be more amenable to land trajectories because you know, here you can fit a line you know, in many different ways and you know, would be not uh, really like, you know, simple you know, for a method. So, so based on this modified local linear embedding, we fit our uh, trajectory. In this case, it's really simple because you don't have uh, complex branches. So we fit, you know, the most parsimonious line using our method. And then, you know, this is the recovered pseudo time based on the subway map plot. And this is the stream plot. And you clearly see this nice progression between uh, from the monocyte to the macrophage. Interestingly, there are like these cells here. So we're really curious to see like why, you know, these cells are there is there an additional branch. So we, you know, thanks to the metadata, we were exploring the, you know, the, the batches. And actually it's interesting that these small cells are coming from, uh, di you know, one digest group and, you know, a particular batch. So this may be like, you know, batch effect that we need to further, you know, correct. But the nice thing about this uh, dimensionality reduction that we use is really sensitive to this. So, it can be like good and bad. In our case, it's good because you know we can uncover potential batch effect and correct and improve our trajectory. So now, based on this model, we try to recover marker genes or marker proteins. In this case, I show you like the the progression. We recover vimentin that was described in the in the paper from Nikolai, but we recover also additional uh, proteins that correlate to the two different. Uh, uh, cell types, and you can also see uh, based on the stream plot, it's really clear that you know vimentin is gradually increasing, and you know this protein is decreasing, and, and so on. And you know, like looking from literature, it seems that you know this protein seems to have been, have been associated to monocyte to macrophages. So I just want to conclude saying, you know, this is a work in progress. There is still a lot of work to do. First is like, what are the features that we need to select? I, as I show you the original result, we use all the proteins. If you use the top 15 principal components, you may get rid of you know, some of this batch effect, but you, know, you have now some outliers here. If you use the weighted PC 
uh, as proposed by Nicolai, you know, seems, things seems to be a little bit more improved. But again, there is still a lot of work, you know, that we need to do. And, you know, the work in progress are, you know, the point that we want to explore systematically, normalization, imputation, visual selection, integration with other modalities that we believe is really valuable. And also this idea of joint learning. Can we learn, you know, trajectory if you have two data types together? And also I want to shout out to Lauren from this morning for developing this package because, you know, there are a lot of things that, you know, we want to explore that you're ready, like, Solve so we will check out your you know bioconductor package, and finally I just want to say that we have you know like our software you know, is all on GitHub, so you can use you know with uh, uh, Python and Jupyter notebooks, Docker if you don't want to install any dependencies. So we have also an interactive website that can be used for non you know computational people to compute. Uh, like your trajectory, but as well to explore interactively your trajectory. And this was developed by John. And, you know, right now is only for transcriptomic data, but our goal is to do for um, other data. And finally, we have, you know, some tutorials and we have, you know, a new tutorial for proteomic data. And finally, we just released this, you know, it's like a, a new visualization for single cell VR. And, you know, we just uploaded the proteomic data, the first, you know, proteomic data from Nikolai, so if you want to check out. And I will stop here and I will take questions. And I want to acknowledge, you know, Nikolai, Idong, Chen, and Jonathan, all the collaborators and the funding sources. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. That was really great seeing what you can do with some of the single cell data out there. Um, we have a few questions. Yes. First up is uh, Bogdan on the pseudo time approach. He queries, how were you picking informative genes and um, how, much, how sensitive is um, your lineage um, choice going to be to imputation? Yeah, yeah. So for the informative genes, you know, like in the community, like people have been using classically viable genes. And you know, like you can do this in, in multiple ways. They can, you know, be like our threshold, take the top 1,000 genes, or based on some statistics. And you know, there is a dependence on that. So this is something that you have to be aware. And you know, this is in particular important if you have rare populations. So the viable genes is not a good model if you want to to capture a rare population. So for this case, you can use, for example, gene index. The second question, you know, for imputation. Absolutely. This is actually a really important point because, you know, this can distort your trajectories or can, you know, like blur, you know, the, the branches. Because the moment you impute, especially close to the branching point, you may actually destroy uh, your signal. So this is something that, you know, you need to do, you to explore carefully. So, and, you know, there are a lot of methods for imputations. In our experience, like, it's better first not to impute genes and just to see what you recover without imputation and then be really careful, you know, when you impute because you can see like, you know, wrong signals. Yeah. Thank you. Next we have a question from Chengji Chan. Um, they ask, um, in their data set, the technical noises seem to be quite a lot stronger than the biological heterogeneity. So they're not getting clear clusters in TSNI or UMAP. Is that going to cause problems for stream-based analysis? Um, will it not be able to give them good uh, trajectories? Yeah, yeah, this is related again to, you know, like the, the selection of genes. Because, you know, this noise will propagate in, in the analysis. So the idea is like if the genes that, you know, are correlated to the real, you know, developmental progression can be reliably detected, you know, then, you know, like, potentially you can, you know, mitigate, you know, this, this problem, you know, when you do like visual selection dimensionality reduction. However, having said that, you know, many of the most informative genes are probably transcription factors for some of these, you know, lineages. And, you know, when they start to be expressed, you know, they are really at the low level. So, you know, there you will, you know, really have problems. You have distortions because, you know, you will not see these genes. And, you know, for me, like, the idea to move to the proteomic data is like 
potentially you can recover these signals that you would never recover, for example, with 10x. So I'm really excited about you know this opportunity. But these are you know you know questions that are you know technology specific. You know, if you use 10x or smart you know the procedures that you may want to use are slightly different. But so in general, there is no simple you know answer. But these are important points to keep in mind. Thank you. Next, we have a question from Christoph van der Rohe asking if stream allows for disconnected or cyclic graphs? Yeah, in the current version, um, you, we don't support this. So what we say, like, you know, you do like, um, when you do the dimensionality reduction, you may see disconnected components. So you can analyze this separately, uh, independently. For cyclic, we don't have yet this uh, functionality, but, you know, we're planning to implement in the, in the next iteration. And um, then we have a question from Luca asking, can you comment on the presence of missing values for zero inflation like you have in single cell RNA set? Um, yeah, this is related to the imputation, right? So again, it depends on, you know, on what are, gene, what are the genes that you don't detect reliably. And, you know, if these lowly expressed genes are not important to your, you know, trajectory is not going to affect too much, you know, this procedure. However, again, in a field like key genes that are, you know, should correlate to your differentiation like description factors, you know, this is going to hit you hard. And, you know, at some point you will recover, you know, when you're outside this, you know, region of, you know, TF priming, you will recover these strong signals, but, you know, close to where, you know, this decision is happening, this is going to like distort the space. So yeah, again, you know, imputation may mitigate this, but for the current single cell technology, unless you go to SmartSeq 3 and 2, like, I don't think you can do much about that. So yeah. Thank you. Oh, I'll just give one last question, which was mm -hmm. um, when you were analyzing the scope two data, yes. did you think there were any particular features that were maybe more problematic or more useful than you might find in single cell RNA sec data? Is there potentially ways you might need or could adapt the software to take particular advantage of um, single cell proteomic data? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one thing I'm really excited that, and, you know, in the conversation with Nicola is the idea that you have like internal replicates for each gene, that the fact that you have like several peptides for a protein. So this is so like useful. I mean, right now, like, we're not using this, we're just taking the median, but if you have like this um, you know, uncertainty propagating in the downstream procedure, I think it's so powerful, right? And you know, it's something that with RNA-seq, you know, you cannot, you know, single cell RNA-seq, you cannot really do. So having this internal, you know, replicates for each protein is, is beautiful. So that, that's, I think, you know, the, the advantage that we have and also the limited detection, you know, as Nikolai has shown, is like much, much better.